Eric Hoffer, Eric Hoffer, July 25, 1898, May 21, 1983, was an American moral and social philosopher. He was the author of ten books and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in February 1983. His first book, The True Believer, 1951, was widely recognized as a classic, receiving critical acclaim from both scholars and laymen, although Hoffer believed that The Ordeal of Change, 1963, was his finest work. Hoffer was born in 1898 in the Bronx, New York, to Canute and Elsa, Goebel, Hoffer. His parents were immigrants from Alsace, then part of Imperial Germany. By age five, Hoffer could already read in both English and his parents' native German. When he was five, his mother fell down the stairs with him in her arms. He later recalled, I lost my sight at the age of seven. Two years before, my mother and I fell down a flight of stairs. She did not recover and died in that second year after the fall. I lost my sight and, for a time, my memory. Hoffer spoke with a pronounced German accent all his life, and spoke the language fluently. He was raised by a living relative or servant, a German immigrant named Martha. His eyesight inexplicably returned when he was 15. Fearing he might lose it again, he seized on the opportunity to read as much as he could. His recovery proved permanent, but Hoffer never abandoned his reading habit. Hoffer was a young man when he also lost his father. The Cabinet Makers Union paid for Knut Hoffer's funeral and gave Hoffer about $300 insurance money. He took a bus to Los Angeles and spent the next 10 years on Skid Row, reading, occasionally writing, and working at odd jobs. In 1931, he considered suicide by drinking a solution of oxalic acid, but he could not bring himself to do it. He left Skid Row and became a migrant worker, following the harvests in California. He acquired a library card where he worked dividing his time between the books and the brothels. He also prospected for gold in the mountains. Snowed for the winter, he read the essays by Michel de Montaigne. Montaigne impressed Hoffer deeply, and Hoffer often made reference to him. He also developed a respect for America's underclass, which he said was lumpy with talent. He wrote a novel, Four Years in Young Hank's Life, and a novella, Chance and Mr. Cunz both partly autobiographical. He also penned a long article based on his experiences in a federal work camp, Tramps and Pioneers. It was never published, but a truncated version appeared in Harper's Magazine after he became well known. Hoffer tried to enlist in the U.S. Army at age 40 during World War II, but he was rejected due to a hernia. Instead, he began work as a longshoreman on the docks off San Francisco in 1943. At the same time, he began to write seriously. Hoffer left the Ducks in 1964, and shortly after became an adjunct professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He later retired from public life in 1970. In 1970, he endowed the Lily Fabili and Eric Hoffer Laconic Essay Prize for students, faculty, and staff at the University of California, Berkeley. Hoffer called himself an atheist but had sympathetic views of religion and described it as a positive force. He died at his home in San Francisco in 1983 at the age of 84. Hoffer was influenced by his modest roots and working-class surroundings, seeing in it vast human potential. In a letter to Margaret Anderson in 1941, he wrote he once remarked, My writing grows out of my life just as a branch from a tree. When he was called an intellectual, he insisted that he simply was a longshoreman. Hoffer has been dubbed by some authors a longshoreman philosopher. Hoffer, who was an only child, never married. He fathered a child with Lily Fabili Osborne, named Eric Osborne, who was born in 1955 and raised by Lily Osborne and her husband, Selden Osborne. Lily Fabili Osborne became acquainted with Hoffer through her husband, a fellow longshoreman and acquaintance of Hoffer apostrophe s. Despite the affair and Lily Osborne later cohabitating with Hoffer, Selden Osborne and Hoffer remained on good terms. Hoffer referred to Eric Osborne as his son or godson. Lily Fabili Osborne died in 2010 at the age of 93. Prior to her death, Osborne was the executor of Hoffer's estate, and vigorously controlled the rights to his intellectual property. In his 2012 book Eric Hoffer, the longshoreman philosopher, journalist Tom Bethel revealed doubts about Hoffer's account of his early life. Although Hoffer claimed his parents were from Alsace-Lorraine, Hoffer himself spoke with a pronounced Bavarian accent. He claimed to have been born and raised in the Bronx but had no Bronx accent. His lover and executor Lily Fabili stated that she always thought Hoffer was an immigrant. Her son, Eric Fabili, 
said that Hoffer's life may have been comparable to that of B. Traven and considered hiring a genealogist to investigate Hoffer's early life, to which Hoffer reportedly replied, Are you sure you want to know? Pescadero landowner Joe Gladstone, a family friend of the fabulous who also knew Hoffer, said of Hoffer's account of his early life, I don't believe a word of it. To this day, no one ever has claimed to have known Hoffer in his youth, and no records apparently exist of his parents, nor indeed of Hoffer himself until he was about 40, when his name appeared in a census. Hoffer came to public attention with the 1951 publication of his first book, The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements, which consists of a preface and 125 sections, which are divided into 18 chapters. Hoffer analyzes the phenomenon of mass movements, a general term that he applies to revolutionary parties, nationalistic movements, and religious movements. He summarizes his thesis in section 113, a movement is pioneered by men of words, materialized by fanatics and consolidated by men of actions. Hoffer argues that fanatical and extremist cultural movements, whether religious, social, or national, arise when large numbers of frustrated people, believing their own individual lives to be worthless or spoiled, join a movement demanding radical change. But the real attraction for this population is an escape from the self, not a realization of individual hopes. A mass movement attracts and holds a following not because it can satisfy the desire for self-advancement, but because it can satisfy the passion for self-renunciation. Hoffer consequently argues that the appeal of mass movements is interchangeable. In the Germany of the 1920s and the 1930s, for example, the communists and national socialists were ostensibly enemies, but sometimes enlisted each other's members, since they competed for the same kind of marginalized, angry, frustrated people. For the true believer, Hoffer argues that particular beliefs are less important than escaping from the burden of the autonomous self. Harvard historian Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. said of the true believer, This brilliant and original inquiry into the nature of mass movements is a genuine contribution to our social thought. Subsequent to the publication of The True Believer, 1951, Eric Hoffer touched upon Asia and American interventionism in several of his essays. In The Awakening of Asia, 1954, published in The Reporter and later his book The Ordeal of Change, 1963, Hoffer discusses the reasons for unrest on the continent. In particular, he argues that the root cause of social discontent in Asia was not government corruption, communist agitation, or the legacy of European colonial oppression and exploitation, but rather that a craving for pride was the central problem in Asia, suggesting a problem that could not be relieved through typical American intervention. For centuries, Hoffer notes, Asia had submitted to one conqueror after another. Throughout these centuries, Asia had been misruled, looted, and bled by both foreign and native oppressors without so much as a peep from the general population. Though not without negative effect, corrupt governments and the legacy of European imperialism represented nothing new under the sun. Indeed, the European colonial authorities had been fairly beneficent in Asia. To be sure, communism exerted an appeal of sorts. For the Asian pseudo-intellectual, it promised elite status and the phony complexities of doctrinary double-talk. For the ordinary Asian, it promised partnership with the seemingly emergent Soviet Union in a tremendous, unprecedented undertaking to build a better tomorrow. According to Hoffer, however, communism in Asia was dwarfed by the desire for pride. To satisfy such desire, Asians would willingly and irrationally sacrifice their economic well-being and their lives as well. Unintentionally, the West had created this appetite, causing revolutionary unrest in Asia. The West had done so by eroding the traditional communal bonds that once had woven the individual to the patriarchal family, clan, tribe, cohesive rural or urban unit, and religious or political body. Without the security and spiritual meaning produced by such bonds, Asians had been liberated from tradition only to find themselves now atomized, isolated, exposed, and abandoned, left orphaned and empty in a cold world. Certainly, Europe had undergone a similar destruction of tradition, but it had occurred centuries earlier at the end of the medieval period and produced better results thanks to different circumstances. For the Asians of the 1950s, the circumstances differed markedly. Most were literate and impoverished, living in a world that included no expansive physical or intellectual vistas. Dangerously, the articulate minority of the Asian population inevitably disconnected themselves from the ordinary people thereby failing to acquire a sense of usefulness and of worth that came by taking part in the world's work. As a result, 
they were condemned to the life of chattering posturing pseudo-intellectuals and coveted the illusion of weight and importance. Most significantly, Hoffer asserts that the disruptive awakening of Asia came about as a result of an unbearable sense of weakness. Indeed, Hoffer discusses the problem of weakness, asserting that while power corrupts the few, weakness corrupts the many. Hoffer notes that the resentment of the weak does not spring from any injustice done them but from the sense of their inadequacy and impotence. In short, the weak hate not wickedness but themselves for being weak. Consequently, self-loathing produces explosive effects that cannot be mitigated through social engineering schemes, such as programs of wealth redistribution. In fact, American generosity is counterproductive, perceived in Asia simply as an example of Western oppression. In the wake of the Korean War, Hoffer does not recommend exporting at gunpoint either American political institutions or mass democracy. In fact, Hoffer advances the possibility that winning over the multitudes of Asia may not even be desirable. If on the other hand, necessity truly dictates that for survival the United States must persuade the weak of Asia to our side, Hoffer suggests the wisest course of action would be to master the art or technique of sharing hope, pride, and as a last resort, hatred with others. During the Vietnam War, Despite his objections to the anti-war movement and acceptance of the notion that the war was somehow necessary to prevent a third world war, Hoffer remained skeptical concerning American interventionism, specifically the intelligence with which the war was being conducted in Southeast Asia. After the United States became involved in the war, Hoffer wished to avoid defeat in Vietnam because of his fear that such a defeat would transform American society for ill opening the door to those who would preach a stab in the back myth and allow for the rise of an American version of Hitler. In the temper of our time, 1967, Hoffer implies that the United States as a rule should avoid interventions in the first place, the better part of statesmanship might be to know clearly and precisely what not to do, and leave action to the improvisation of chance. In fact, Hoffer indicates that it might be wise to wait for enemies to defeat themselves, as they might fall upon each other with the United States out of the picture. The view was somewhat borne out with the Cambodian-Vietnamese War and Chinese-Vietnamese War of the late 1970s. In May 1968, about a year after the Six-Day War, he wrote an article for the Los Angeles Times titled Israel's Peculiar Position. Hoffer asks why everyone expects the Jews to be the only real Christians in this world and why Israel should sue for peace after its victory. Hoffer believed that rapid change is not necessarily a positive thing for a society and that too rapid change can cause a regression in maturity for those who are brought up in a different society. He noted that in America in the 1960s, many young adults were still living in extended adolescence. Seeking to explain the attraction of the new left protest movements, he characterized them as the result of widespread affluence, which is robbing a modern society of whatever it has left of puberty rights to routinize the attainment of manhood. He saw the puberty rights as essential for self-esteem and noted that mass movements and juvenile mindsets tend to go together, to the point that anyone, no matter what age, who joins a mass movement immediately begins to exhibit juvenile behavior. Hoffer further noted that working-class Americans rarely join protest movements and subcultures since they had entry into meaningful labor as an effective right of passage out of adolescence while both the very poor who lived on welfare and the affluent were, in his words, prevented from having a share in the world's work, and of proving their manhood by doing a man's work and getting a man's pay and thus remained in a state of extended adolescence. Lacking in necessary self-esteem, they were prone to joining mass movements as a form of compensation. Hoffer suggested that the need for meaningful work as a rite of passage into adulthood could be fulfilled with a two-year civilian national service program, like programs during the Great Depression such as the Civilian Conservation Corps. The routinization of the passage from boyhood to manhood would contribute to the solution of many of our pressing problems. I cannot think of any other undertaking that would dovetail so many of our present difficulties into opportunities for growth. Hoffer appeared on public television in 1964 and then in two one-hour conversations on CBS with Eric Severide in the late 1960s. Hoffer's papers, including 131 of the notebooks he carried in his pockets, were acquired in 2000 by the Hoover Institution Archives. The papers fill of shelf space. Because Hoffer cultivated an aphoristic style, the unpublished notebooks, dated from 1949 to 1977, contain very significant work. Although available for scholarly study since at least 2003, little of their contents has been published. A selection of 50 aphorisms, focusing on the development of unrealized human talents through the creative process, appeared in the July 2005 issue of Harper's Magazine. 
Mm-hmm. Conversations with Eric Hoffer, 12-part interview by James Day of KQED, San Francisco, 1963. Eric Hoffer, The Passionate State of Mind with Eric Severide, CBS, September 19, 1967, rebroadcast on November 14, due to popular demand. The Savage Heart, A Conversation with Eric Hoffer, with Eric Severide, CBS, January 28, 1969. On the 1st of January, 2001, the Eric Hoffer Award for Books and Prose was launched internationally in his honor. In 2005, the Eric Hoffer Estate granted its permission for the award, and Christopher Klim became the award's chairperson. Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop extensively referred to Hoffer's book The True Believer when in a 2015 speech she closely compared the psychological underpinnings of ISIS with that of Nazism. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.